Mesdames, Messieurs les Présidents. Ladies and gentlemen, the President, Mr. Prime Minister, Ministers, Parliamentarians, Ambassadors, Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I have hesitated a lot uh, regarding this speech this morning. There is a tradition, but I wondered if it would not be preferable to focus on the G7 meeting, which has just uh, finished. The only risk I would have run would have been not up to the results uh, obtained collectively, but I think this shared moment before the work you will be undertaking will be useful and is useful. First of all, because it's the third time we have uh, uh, met here for this format, so it's worth following up. And following the G7 that France has just organized uh, gives it even more value and meaning. First of all, I'd like to say the, the success of this G7 summit is your success, that of the diplomats who organized it, the elected officials who supported it, the teams with all their professionalism, representatives of many ministries were involved. The relative difficulties are assumed collectively uh, notably at the level of the heads of government, but the success was due to the French team, your team, and I would like very sincerely to thank you, first of all, for the preparation for months by the Secretary General of the Presidency, the work of all the government departments, securing the event, the organization, combining the elected officials, representatives of French society, gave a good image of France. And for the first time, for a long time, we have had a G7 summit that was held in conditions of calm and of great usefulness. It was a very useful summit. The future will say, if this G7 is a complete success, we will see how the results obtained will be strengthened or not in the future. But I can already say that what has been done is thanks to you and it is your success. I also believe that this G7 meeting was part of a procedure of an approach that is in line with our strategy, the strategy of putting France at the heart of the diplomatic stage in line with, over the last two years, what I've been uh, saying over the last two years. I have been reviewing these last few days the two last speeches I made to the ambassadors' meetings. E each of them focused on three th topics. Security, sovereignty, and influence. And these values remain valid. The fight against terrorism action in each of those areas all come together. And the strategy we have been implementing for two years is coherent and was evident and was obvious uh, during the summit. And uh, reviewing my speeches made me feel very humble because many things that I hoped would move forward quickly have not moved forward that quickly. And a lot of things that I said two years ago, uh, uh, the Sahel, the Libyan crisis are still with us and many other crises as well. Nevertheless, I would like to say something strikes me, which I wished to share with you before going into more detail. Everything comes together. Everything is coherent. The Prime Minister will review the transformations led by France, the government, the meaning of this transformation, the continuity between this and our diplomacy. I'm struck by the fact by, by the fact that more and more of our citizens see your action as very important. The depth, the real uh, feeling of our country is that we are a country where, unfortunately, 
we condemn this with great strength. We're going to people attack elected officials. Some people attack elected officials or attack their officers. We are a country. Uh, we are proud to host the whole world as we did yesterday and get results. Our relationship with the world uh, irrigates the nation, inspires our nation. So I don't want to see our discussions, our exchanges as separate from the rest, the rest of our life, but as part of the underlying logic of what we're doing, the social agenda, the economic agenda, uh, the economic agenda, all of that is coherent. That's why I want to, first of all, to share with you a brief, a brief review of the world and of the disorders in the world and, above all, our priorities. Our priorities must inspire actions in France, in Europe and on, an inter on the international stage. You know these better than I do. The international order is being shaken up in an unusual way, in an unprecedented way, a deep upheaval which, uh, for the first time in our history, History is affecting every field uh, with his, in his, to an historic extent. First of all, the transformation, the recomposition, the geopolitical uh, recomposition, the geostrategic recomposition. We are experiencing the end of the Western hegemony over the world. We had become used to an international order since the 18th century based on Western hegemony. In the 18th century, probably led by France, thanks to the age of the Enlightenment. British, led by the British in the 19th century because of the Industrial Revolution, and in the 20th century, led by the United States because of the two world wars and the economic domination of the United States in the 20th century. Things have changed. Westerners have made mistakes in certain crises, certain choices. US choices, US decisions uh, have also had an impact, which have led to reviewing the involvement, the implications in certain conflicts in the Near and Middle East and uh, reviewing the diplomatic and military strategy. Certain intangibles, what we thought were intangibles, have in fact started to change. And uh, so today the geopolitical realities have changed. And we have the emergence of new powers which we have underestimated, to begin with, China and the Russian strategy for a few years. They have been more successful. I will say more about that later. India is emerging and other new economies are becoming powers, not only economic powers, but political powers. And they see themselves as civilizations, different state civilizations, which shake up our international order, affect the economic order and lead us to rethink our political thinking and the political imagination imagination which much greater strength and inspiration than we have. Look at India, uh, Russia and China. They, their political inspiration is much more powerful than that of the Europeans. They're thinking of the, of the, they think the world based on philosophy, logic and imagination which we have lost. And that is shaking us up and re-shuffling the cards in our, in our hands. The emergence of Africa as well. Every day we see it every day, which uh, results in the deep reconstruction, restructuring. The risk of this deep change, which uh, is not uh, only geopolitical, it's also military. There are more and more conflicts, and I see two major risks. The first one, these conflicts have led to more and more civilian casualties. Uh, look at theatres of operation across the world. The second thing, the 
decline of civilization, the, uh, which calls into question our certainties and our organization. Things are disappearing. We are abandoning treaties, controlling weapons, for example, keeping uh, which date from the Cold War. And innocently, we seem to be, and we, silently, we seem to be getting rid of, of all these uh, treaties. This raises deep questions for us. Our dogmas, our habits are no longer valid. And next, it has to lead us to think about our own strategy, to question our own strategy, because those who have the, cut, the key cards in the hands are the United States and China. So we have a choice to make. Uh, regarding this big change, this important change. We have to decide, do we want to be minority alloys, allies of both of them, or do we want to have our share in the game, play our part in, in, in the game? At the same time, uh, the market economy is undergoing an unusual crisis, an unprecedented crisis. And I think this crisis is as important, and it also has to be taken into account. This market economy, which uh, emerged from Europe, which was thought by Europe, conceived by Europe, has gradually moved, has gradually drifted over the last uh, decades. First of all, it has financialized itself. What used to be a market economy, some even talked about a social market economy, which was at the heart of the balances we used to, we had achieved, has become an accumulative capitalism economy. Financialization and then technological change have resulted in a growing concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of the champions, the talented people in our countries, the big successful metropolitan world cities and the countries that support this success. Therefore, the market economy, which until now, through the comparative uh, advantages of theory of the co comparative benefits, which allowed us to share wealth and work very well for decades, it got, us, it got hundreds of millions of people uh, out of poverty across the world. But we are, many of them are now falling back into poverty, and we see growing inequalities which are unbearable. We've seen this in France in recent months, but we have seen this for many years now across the world as well. And this market economy produces inequalities, original, new forms of inequalities, which are shaking up our political order as well, first of all. Uh, they are contesting the legitimacy of our economic organization. How can we explain to our fellow citizens that it's a good organization when they don't have their share of this economy? It's calling into question the balance of our economy. Since the 18th century, we had managed to strike a balance between liberties, the democratic system and the regular progress of the middle classes was a kind of tripod on which we moved forward, on which we, we relied. When the middle classes at the base of our democracies don't see their interests, uh, they are legitimately tempted, but they have doubts. They are tempted to go for more liberalism or for calling into question the economic system or more authority. The deep changes of paradigm which uh, have donc, uh, resulted in big challenges. So this crisis can lead to the closures. France has not decided, France did not decide in the spring of 2017, but this, the, the temptation of closing up, of looking inwards is very strong. We, how can we rethink the balance of our system, which is known, isn't only a French system, it's a European and global system? How can we make the opening of our economy is in line with our DNA and our values. Uh, how can we open up and while at the same time retaining some control over what's happening? What the Brexiters have been proposing to the British people 
We gaining control of our life, of our nation, we must agir, know how to think and act in an open nation, retaking control. The time is over when we explain uh, to, our, uh, to our fellow citizens that relocations and, uh, uh, is natural, it's normal. That doesn't work anymore. We have to find the ways and means of influencing globalization, rethinking the the international order. This won't be done overnight. It's necessary to adopt this approach in France and in Europe. Otherwise, we will fail. The third deep upheaval is the technological change, of course, the internet, social networks, artificial intelligence, globalization of intelligence and technological progress, which is unprecedentedly fast. But this globalization is also uh, uh, the globalization of imagination, emotions, violence, and hatred, and the a spread of, uh, uh, of anti-civilizational forces is some, something new which is emerging in front of us, which calls for rethinking the rules of the international order. These new rules don't exist today, and I deeply believe that this technological revolution will lead to imbalances, economic imbalances, but also anthropological imbalances we have to act on. Otherwise, we will have what I call a diplomacy that will be left behind, that will be uh, uh, the others are using this approach to destabilize democracies. Finally, there is the ecological upheaval, this uh, upheaval. I deeply believe this upheaval is accelerating. For several years, we have observed, and France's diplomacy has focused more and more on the environment with, very effectively, the COP21 was a success. The Paris Agreement was a success. So this issue is uh, uh, global warming, the fight for biodiversity. It's accelerating because the effects, the impact of our collective inaction in the past are now being felt today in our societies, in our economies, and it's accelerating also because our fellow citizens are aware, are much more aware of this, and they want us to, to act, to take action. And it's accelerating because the impact of this upheaval uh, take the form of political crises, uh, crises. and the, the, the ecological upheaval leads to imbalances, local imbalances, regional imbalances, migratory movements, which have uh, a destabilizing effect on our world. So this, all these upheavals are occurring at the same time. You know all this. What we need is to put things into perspective. We doesn't simply observe and say, this is what's happened. We have to think about what action we can take today to be useful, saying things, but what is our share of... Uh, we can either remain as spectators, commentators, uh, I could just stop uh, at what I've just said. Or we could say, we'll continue in France as before in this context. This strategy, this cautious strategy, or continuing with our habits, following our habits, if we continue to uh, behave as before, uh, be, I, be we a company, uh, um, a soldier, a businessman, if we continue as before, we will definitely lose control. And that will lead to our disappearance, uh, our civilization will disappear, Europe will disappear, Europe will, uh, the West will disappear, and the world will be structured around two poles, the United States of America and China. And we will have to choose between the, do the domination of one or the other. We can pretend to ignore this reality. We can explain we are sovereign. We're fighting to preserve jobs in our countries through 
through compromises, through uh, lame compromises, will try and implement environmental politics in our country or continent, but it will be too late because we will no longer have any, any control and things will get worse. Uh, that is the slope which, down which we are tempted to, to go, but there is another approach, another strategy, which is adapt which consists of saying to react more quickly in the face of this change. We have to adapt to this new order which uh, to implement reform to catch up with the others, but without really changing, without really influencing things. It's a kind of middle way, a kind of intermediate scenario, which, in my view, will lead to the same results with probably consequences which will lead to a rejection by our people. We're not a country that likes to adapt itself. We want to change the world, but we don't like adapting. I think France's calling, which corresponds also to the needs of the world of today, is to try and influence the world order with our assets, with our strengths, in order not to give in to inevitabilities, but to try and build a new order in which we will have our place, but our values and interests uh, will be defended, will be highlighted. And this is an audacious strategy. This involves taking risks. Everything that we're doing and everything that we'll do in the future may not succeed. And lots of commentators will tell us we're failing. That's not serious. That's not a, a problem. What is a problem today is not trying, uh, given everything I've just said. So it's an audacious strategy based on the vision to try, in this context, to identify what characterizes the French spirit, to refound our European civilization to, to redefine the basis of our European civilization in our country, in our European strategy, and on an international level. The French mindset is a sense of the universal and a spirit of resistance, not giving in to fatalities, not giving in to uh, inevitable inevitability. Where we, of course, reform, we beef up our economy and we manage to change things, but we, must, we don't want to give in to the established order. We need to rediscover our deep values. I think what has always characterized Europe, the thread that has always run through Europe is real humanism. And I say so because it's not evident anymore. If we just follow the trends of the world which I've described, this European humanism will disappear. The United States of America are part of the Western camp, but they don't uh, defend the same humanism. They are interested in... Uh, they don't have the same uh, priorities. Uh, they focus on liberty, uh, which characterizes the American civilization, which also explains our differences in spite of the fact that we are allies. And the Chinese civilization doesn't have the same options or collective preferences, those same values as ours. We are the only geographic space which has put man, with a capital M, at the heart of its project. At the Renaissance and the age of the Enlightenment and every time we've had to reinvent ourselves. And given these upheavals, that is what our ambition should be. This supposes that on the major questions, industrial, climate, we must have this adopt this approach with ourselves, and the, we must have an educational, productive, social, ecological project, which ha we have to review it. Uh, we, we can't review this uh, in the same way as socialism in one country didn't function. Humanism in one country doesn't uh, last either. So we have to act on a, a European and international. And that is the, the logic of our agenda. This humanist project, which is at the heart of the government's agenda, by reinvesting in humanity in, in, through education, health and social, by implementing reforms, 
And the ecological transformation is indispensable as well. What we should be inspired, collectively, we must be inspired by what I've just said. And I am aware of the road ahead. We have to rebuild on this basis a, a new narrative, a new imagination. And that's why I deeply believe that our project must be seen as a European civilization project. And it cannot be supported by Hungary, Catholic Hungary, or Orthodox Russia. And uh, uh, we, and I say this with great respect for those countries. Listen to uh, speeches in Hungary and Russia. Uh, they, there are differences, but they are supporting uh, cultural and civilizational project, which I consider as erroneous, as, but which is inspiring. We need to, through the European project, which I deeply believe is a French project, we must find it a source of inspiration. The spirit of the Renaissance, the spirit of the Age of Enlightenment, this French humanism that we have supported and invented and we have to reinvent today. What does this mean? All the issues we often evoke can't be only technical uh, issues. They must contribute to uh, inspiring our imagination and a civilizational project where we put men and women at the heart of this project. I am aware, of course, of the ambition of such a project, but I think it was important for me to share this conviction with you today because this is what must inspire our action and the continuity of our action on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, the new alliances, this project implies that we should put the dignity of man at the, the heart. Those who are defending human uh, liberties at the risk of their lives are looking to us. When I'm talking about the European uh, and French civilizational project, we must rediscover this sense and across the world, without calling into question the sovereignty of each country, we have to defend the strength and the vitality of human rights, which are threatened. And uh, David Miliband, in a recent conference, referred to the age of impunity. Twenty years ago, we would have said, we would have, human rights are uh, inevitable, they are progressing, everybody automatically will become democratic, will share our values. Look at the situation in the world today. Even in Europe, we have seen rights, human rights are declining, are threatened, are under threat, and there are threats of war. Therefore, our responsibility in this context I believe in our ability of, to revive the spirit of the Age of the Enlightenment. We must be the players, the key players, uh, supporting new requirements in terms of human rights, new requirements for, our, for defending our, our values in the theatres of uh, operation. We must defend civilians and humanitarian forces. And in recent weeks, we have shown the importance of defending an internet that def respects democracies and the balances that we absolutely require. Defending this European civilization, having as an objective to defend this civilization at home and abroad, also implies in our diplomatic action to have an educational, climate democratic vocation to rethink the balances of the equilibrium of the uh, market economy and to have a cultural agenda as well at the heart of this ambition and of this state of mind. To achieve all this, I would like in the next few months, in line with what we have been doing, we can act collectively along five priorities. I'm not going to cover all the geographical areas or all the issues 
don't the silence vaut des intérêts. Uh, it's not because I can't mention everything that I'm not interested in other uh, aspects. Uh, already, I think my speech is going to be too long. I can't be exhaustive anyway. There are five important things I would like to underscore after explaining how I see the world order and our objective. In this the first thing, in order to achieve this uh, objective, I believe that what we must do is to play our role, play our part as a balancing power, a balancing power that we are a, a big power, economic, industrial, although we have lost our preeminence over the last de decades in some areas. In many areas, we have to rebuild, and we must rebuild in order to remain a power. It's at the heart of our national and European agenda. We are a military and political power that remains. We are becoming indisputably the first, French, the first European army through our investments, through the quality of our soldiers and the attractiveness of our army. And today in Europe, nobody has that can equal that vitality, and nobody has decided to make this strategic and human investment. And we remain a major diplomatic power, mem permanent member of the Security Council, at the heart of Europe and at the heart of many coalitions. When I say we must be a balancing power, we must have the freedom to act, the mobility, the, the flexibility. We're not aligned or oh, not a power that is aligned. We have allies, we are European, and we must work with our European partners by respecting them. We have allies in each part of the world, and we have an important ally, the United States of America, in terms of strategy and uh, military. But in simple words, we're not a power that considers uh, the enemies of our friends are necessarily ours. And I think that's the strength of France, and we must have our own strategy, because this strategy is at the service of our interests and also of our usefulness uh, in the world, as uh, shown in recent weeks and in recent days. So as a balancing power, we have a special role to play in crisis situations. Let's take the example of Iran. In recent days, in Biarritz, by creating the conditions for de-escalation, the foreign minister, the minister of the, of the economy, for two days, after several weeks of initiatives, they worked very hard for two days to try not only to influence the situation, but also to create the conditions for a de-escalation and for a change. In Regarding Iran, uh, France did not initiate the, G the, the JCPAO. Uh, we uh, hardened, the, toughened the conditions in 2015. But we are in, uh, uh, we, uh, sub we signed a treaty, one party decided to withdraw from that treaty, the divergences of views between us, ourselves could lead to an escalation of tensions in the region with terrible consequences. Our role in such a conflict is, on the one hand, to ensure that the big powers act in a concerted way. Two key messages shared by all. Nobody at the G7 wants Iran to have a nuclear weapon, and everybody wants uh, stability and peace in the region. This means that we will abstain from acting in any way that will threaten this peace and stability. On the other hand, we have tried to, to attract more uh, Iran more to, uh, to our talks uh, in order to 
preempt certain consequences. We have obtained certain results, fragile results, but uh, in the bilateral talks with Iran, we have identified a possible way forward with economic and financial compensations and extra demands, which in the short term have led to a de-escalation and creating the possible conditions for useful future meetings. We did so in consultation with our European partners and by playing our role as a balancing power and to play this role in a useful way, as we did during the G7, we must be able fully to express our form of independence, which is independence, indispensable and autonomy, our, our strategic autonomy, which means deeply rethinking our relationship with certain powers. I know, as some theoretician's would say abroad, we have a deep state of uh, mind. Sometimes the President of the Republic says things and the collective uh, People's reaction might be to say, he said that, but we know the truth. We will continue as we've always done. No, I'm not going to follow, go down that road. I'm going to ask you not to go down that road as well, because collectively it's ineffective anyway. It, de it reduces the credibility of what the President of the Republic says and, and the people who also, the people who represent him. And above all, it reduces our ability to influence things. So in our ability to review our relationships, there is first of all our relationship with Russia, I know that many of you have uh, been specializing uh, in, uh, in Russia, and you have come to the conclusion that we must be suspicious of Russia. This relationship, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there, uh, ha there have been some misunderstandings with Russia. There have been, uh, I, we need to we, have to, we have to review our relationship with Russia, but I, have uh, a number of observations to make. We are in Europe, and Russia is also in Europe. And if we don't uh, do something useful with Russia, we will remain with the sterile tensions that exist. We'll continue to have uh, conflicts which are frozen across Europe. We will continue to have uh, uh, Europe, where, which is the theater of a, a struggle between the United States and Russia. And the, the consequences of the Cold War will continue in our countries, and we will not create the right conditions for recreating European civilization, which is the aim I defined, because we, we cannot do so without reviewing, without changing our link, our ties with Russia. On top of that, uh, uh, distancing Russia, pushing Russia away from, from Europe, force, forcing Russia to uh, isolate itself or to be tempted to form an alliance with China is not in our interest. At the same time, our relationship is structured, and this uh, structuring, this structuring has uh, has uh, often uh, fed the relationship. Russia has a very conservative project, which is opposed to the European Union's values. All of this. Uh, developed in the 1990s uh, uh, and the early 2000s, uh, Europe did not have its own strategy and gave uh, the feeling of being the Trojan horse uh, for those who wish to destroy Russia. And uh, this re resulted in the weakening of uh, the European Union. We can deplore it. So, Either we stay in this war of positions, but it's not in our interest to do so. So, our, nor is it in our interest to be weak vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia, and, uh, to forget all our disagreements, the past conflicts, and uh, uh, start uh, 
engaging uh, in a, a new relationship. We have to rethink the relationship. We have to build a new architecture based on trust and security. The European continent will never be stable, will never be secure if we don't pacify and clarify our relations with Russia. It's not in the interest of some of our allies, of course, uh, and some of our uh, allies will want more sanctions, and uh, it's in their because it's in their interests, even if they are uh, they claim to be our friends. But it's not in our interests. And in order to achieve the objective, I.